Welcome to From AMIA to Armistice, a series of podcasts commissioned by UCL Institute of Education. I'm Simon Bendry, Director of the UCL Institute of Education's First World War Centenary Battlefield Tours Programme. In August 2018, students from across the United Kingdom joined students from France, the United States, Canada and Australia on the Western Front to commemorate the Battle of Amiens. This series, recorded largely on location during that battlefield tour, tells the story of the Battle of Amiens in the wider context of the First World War and the road to armistice. In this podcast, we mark the centenary of the Battle of Amiens with a series of reflections from representatives of the Allied Nations recorded during the battlefield tour at the Chateau de Flixicourt and Amiens Cathedral. The first question that many of you are asking is why have we made that journey across from Albert this evening to come here? On the 7th of August, 1918, at a chateau in Flixicourt, General Rawlinson and his staff had set the wheels in motion for an attack close to here, near Amiens. It was from this town that Rawlinson's staff kicked off the Battle of Amiens. What we've done is to create a short film for you. It'll just introduce, in Rawlinson's words, the significance of the centenary that we commemorate tomorrow. Monday, the 11th of November, 1918. The armistice was signed this morning, and hostilities ceased at 11 a.m. Our cavalry posts are just up to the Belgian frontier. This complete victory is wonderful. Germany is breaking up into a series of independent republics. The Kaiser has gone to Holland. I would never have hoped to attain this degree of success in just three short months after our achievements at Amiens on the 8th of August. Looking back now, it seems incredible that all this should have come to pass. We owe it to three things. To the spirit of the troops. Their recovery after the German offensives of this spring is a glorious testimony to British grit. To the way old Foch pulled the operations of the Allies together. And to Haig's faith in victory this year. He believed in it long before I did, and when all the people at home were talking about plans for 1919. He not only believed in it, but went out for it. And he must be a proud and thankful man today. I have written him a letter of congratulation. I have been looking at the figures of the 4th Army since the 8th of August. We captured 79,000 prisoners and 1,100 guns, and our casualties numbered 110,000. I have commanded British... Australians, Canadians, South Africans, and Americans. If we make a proper peace, it is with these peoples that the future of the world should rest. From Amiens to Aven has been a wonderful story. I may live to write it someday. Jeremy Wright, and I'm Secretary of State for Digital Media, Culture and Sport. This experiment, Amion 100, is a way in which we can bring together a variety of different nationalities, students from a variety of different countries, to come together and understand and learn together. That is an experiment to a degree, but it isn't new because it reflects the process that happened at the Battle of Amiens and in the Hundred Days campaign beyond it, of bringing together a variety of different nations, contributing the best they have to offer, working together in order to turn the tide in this terrible conflict. So I think there's a wonderful symbolism about this programme. It isn't just a way of giving young people an opportunity to understand better the First World War, though it undoubtedly does that very successfully. It's also a way of demonstrating to them in a very real sense what made the difference here. 
And what I think made the difference here was the ability to work together to derive the best you can from a variety of different groups of people, all with different backgrounds, and put something together that made a real difference. And I think they're learning that here in very real, practical senses. So for me, this is a hugely successful program. And I hope that all those who've participated in it take home the lessons they've learned and have a real sense of fulfilment from what they've understood here. I'm Andrew Murison, MP. I'm the Prime Minister's Special Representative for the commemoration of the centenary of the Great War. For me, AMIA is the beginning of the end. It marks the point at which the fighting during the Great War shifted from being pretty static to being very kinetic much to the surprise of many of those involved at the time. So a hundred days later we have armistice, the end of the Great War, and cause for much thanksgiving. But we have to explain how we got there from the stasis that characterises much of the Great War period. And AMIA really gives us a clue to that. It's the arrival of the Americans, for example, in large numbers. It involved a large number of allies working together. It involved mechanisation. All of that, together with the demoralisation of the German army at that time, meant that a huge amount of progress was made during this battle and in the days that followed, which led ultimately to peace in November 1918. What we're doing now is marking the beginning of that journey from what most people associate with the Great War, and that is the awfulness of trench warfare and stasis to the blessed relief of the end of the Great War a hundred years later. My name is Monique Seafried. I am a commissioner on the US World War I Centennial Commission. I am here because I have an enormous amount of gratitude. You can hear from my accent that I am originally French. So in some ways I represent the 20 percent American soldiers in the American Expeditionary Forces who were foreign-born. I have such a gratitude, because I am French-born, for what the British, for what the American did for our country, for France, in World War I and in World War II. So it's a great honor to be a participant and also an organizer for the World War I Centennial Commission. Americans have to thank the British for allowing them to come to France because without British ships, the Americans could not really have arrived in France to help fight these last battles of the war. So, as an exchange, the British requested to have American troops fighting under British command. We have right now soldiers from three American divisions who have their lineage in the units who fought with the British during the Battle of Amiens and in Flanders also. We were in Ypres in the past two days to recognize one of those divisions who fought in Flanders. But two of those divisions fought with the British in the Battle of Amiens. We have also a group of National Guard soldiers normally following the request from the governor of their states. During wartime, they were federalized and they were part of the National Army. So those young people today, our National Guard people, are right now in Amiens, will participate in the ceremony and it will be incredibly meaningful to them. They have been extraordinarily moved by all the British cemeteries we have visited with them in the past few days. This really works so well with this student program that we are celebrating today, which is phenomenal. My name is Seamus O'Regan. I'm the Minister of Veterans Affairs for the Government of Canada. We're here in Amiens looking at a lovely evening after what's been a very hot day and really awestruck by the students and what they've managed to produce here. I enjoy the fact that they see Canada as such a badass country. Isn't that something? The use of the Canadians was clear to the Germans that something was afoot. Their contribution was so valuable. They were more or less the stormtroopers. This is a battle that was fought by intelligence and by cunning. And we were at the forefront of that, so much so that to have us at the front line was a dead giveaway that something was happening. And that's just not how we think of Canadians, you know, very amicable. Of course we are. But in a fight, we were capable of doing some very, very effective things. 
The stronger thing, though, to be honest, is that these students are getting their heads around the complexities of war. A bunch of strange coincidences can happen, and with bad judgment and poor action, suddenly we find ourselves with such devastation. And yet these men fought, and they fought bravely. And that resonates. Hello, I'm Colonel Scott Klingen. I'm the Australian Defence Force attaché for commemorations based here on the Western Front. I've been fortunate to have this job for the last five years over the centenary of the First World War, uh, looking after commemorations uh, in France and Belgium. Amiens 100 is a special event because for the last four years we've had a lot of commemorations about disastrous battles and disastrous attacks. Amiens 100 really shows the turning point in the war where the Allies finally got on the front foot as you'll see by the commemoration tomorrow in the cathedral, it's not in a cemetery, it's not a dower event, it's more an event to say that the war has turned and we're heading towards what will be in 100 days time, finally the end of World War I. That's not to say it's not a sad time, a reflective time, but it is a turning point where I think a lot of people can reflect from this point forward. The war did certainly change and moved to where a lot of people could finally see an end to what had been a lot of misery for the four preceding years. I'm Colonel Anthony Egan, I'm the Australian Defence Attaché posted to Paris, and I've been here for three years. The importance of the Battle of Amiens from Australia's perspective is the role that Australia played as a part of the Allied nations in the battle itself. Prior to this battle, we had spent an amount of time in and around Amiens at Vélez Bretonneur on the 25th of April in 1918 and then at Le Hamel on the 4th of July. Two very important battles for the history of the Australian military. But Amiens represented the point where the Allied nations turned the tide and it was important for Australia to be part of that. It was the first time that our entire force, the five divisions, had fought together under the banner and the leadership of John Monash at the time. General Monash was a consummate planner. He was an engineer, he was an artilleryman. He, above all of our commanders, learnt the lessons of previous battles, he knew what was required. From the soldiers' perspective, they never thought it was going to go as long as it did. They'd get across there, do what they had to do and then get home for Christmas and help out old Blighty, but the truth was something completely different. It was very dark days. They fought for each other, they fought for themselves, they fought for their families. For such a small country in terms of the numbers that we had available, it was quite a large percentage that made the journey across to fight on the Western Front. And I don't think there's probably an Australian family from those days that still exists now. It doesn't have some family member that was involved at some point in World War I. Je m'appelle Mayel, j'ai 12 ans. Je pense que euh, la commémoration euh, reflète la paix qui a eu après la guerre euh, qui a été très sanglante. Euh, on est à Amiens dans la Somme et euh, on se trouve euh, où s'est déroulée la guerre. Donc euh, c'est un honneur de se trouver ici. Bonjour, je m'appelle Adèle, j'ai 11 ans. La commémoration, la fin de la guerre, pour moi, c'est détruire les barrières. Les Allemands, ils nous ont descendus jusqu'ici, à la Somme, et grâce aux Britanniques et à tous nos alliés, on a réussi à remonter jusqu'à novembre. Bonjour, je m'appelle Ryan, j'ai 12 ans et j'habite à Versailles. La commémoration d'Amiens, pour moi, ça signifie des choses positives pour l'avenir. S'entendre avec des personnes qu'on ne connaît pas, qui viennent des pays étrangers, Parler avec eux, et c'est bien. C'est bien pour le futur. Hello, I'm Bob Lewis, the director of the British Council of France. Today, we're thinking about Amiens and the battle. It's been very special to come here and see, first of all, this huge interest in something that happened 100 years ago and the fact that it has a bigger meaning today than we ever thought 10, 20, 30 years ago. We're listening to the noise of a thunderstorm, the first one after two months of very, very dry weather. A hundred years ago, our troops from all over the world, both sides really, were having to deal with tremendous hardship. And to think that we can still now remember them and do something to commemorate is essential. I come from the UK, but I've been in France now 25 years. In the schools here in France, they really do talk about the war as something which is a learning experience. And what we have today in France is a real desire for partnership and collaboration with other school children from around the world. And in this event, we've really seen that. So for me, the way in which we can use it to build trust, partnership, 
a way of looking at democracy and civil society in a much more open, collaborative way is an essential follow-on from what happened 100 years ago. Je salue aussi les représentants de l'Allemagne qui nous ont rejoints. C'est tous ensemble que nous souhaitons bâtir notre avenir. The Reverend Dr. David Coulter, Chaplain General of Her Majesty's Land Forces, so I'm Chaplain General of the Army, and it's a huge privilege to come to Amiens Cathedral where we are today, to be here at the time of the 100th anniversary of that battle. I was really struck to how the Bishop of Amiens started the service by saying, peace be with you. Those few words must have meant so much to soldiers fighting here 100 years ago. He also spoke about hope. I think a place like this magnificent cathedral, which extraordinarily was not damaged during the war, a place that's been here for 800 years, symbolizing man's appreciation of the glory of God, became a place of peace, a place of sanctuary, a place of hope for soldiers, for refugees, for local people, for generations, not least of all in the time of war. I was also very taken by the senior chaplain from the Canadian Forces giving a little sip of water from his water bottles to soldiers who he found wounded on the battlefield, many of whom were enemy soldiers. It struck me that there's no such thing as an atheist in a foxhole. It's very much that the chaplain was there to minister to all. I think part of the chaplain's role is to bring men to God and God to man, and particularly in a time of battle in a time of war, which happened certainly during the First World War and absolutely ever since. I think the chaplain's presence does three things. It's incarnational, it's being with the soldier wherever the soldier goes, and that's as true in the trenches in the First World War as it is in Afghanistan or Iraq or today in Syria, or wherever soldiers are deployed, chaplains will deploy with them. I think secondly, and the Canadian chaplain's comments about giving a little sip of water is almost a sacrament. Some people would have sought Holy Communion, but actually a lot of soldiers, whether they believed in God or not, would have found something very sacramental about receiving a blessing, which may be nothing more than peace be with you and a sip of water from a chaplain. And I think finally, the chaplain's there 
to provide that penitential rite in people's last days when they are facing their end to know they could die peacefully with a chaplain nearby. My name is Nick Perry. I head up the Department of Justice in Northern Ireland, and I'm here in Amiens Cathedral representing the Northern Ireland Executive as one of the devolved regions of the United Kingdom. 1918 is a very big year for the entire island of Ireland in the First World War. In the spring offensives of March 1918, the two Irish divisions, the 16th and the 36th Ulster divisions, were virtually destroyed. The 16th Irish Division wasn't recreated, but the Ulster Division was and took an important part in the Hundred Days campaign in the autumn of 1918. There were Irishmen, of course, fighting in the Battle of Amiens, but the two Irish Divisions weren't here. 1918 was an enormously important year for the island of Ireland and its contribution to the First World War. This was the most extraordinary occasion today. The former countries were once enemies joining together to commemorate the people who fought and died in this battle. This is one of a series of events on the Somme, marking the course of the war in 2016 at Messines in Ypres in 2017 and now here at Amiens in 2018. It's been an enormously important commemorative event back in Ireland, in Northern Ireland itself, but across the island it's been an opportunity for people together to consider the joint history of the two parts of Ireland in what was one of the great European tragedies. You have been listening to From Amiens to Armistice, a Chrome Radio production for UCL Institute of Education. The producer was Katrina Oliphant, with sound design by Chris Sharp. In our next podcast, we join Professor Sir Hugh Strawn for the second of his morning briefings, when he considers the evolution of the war in 1918 and why the Battle of Amiens in the August was such a success for the Allied forces.